yo yo bullet. People are going to come in um, throughout. So, yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, silicone cupping today. And like I mentioned, um, I do have a PowerPoint. So I'm just going to go ahead and start. So you're not looking at my face all the time, but you can actually see some slides that go along with what I'm saying. And Oh. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, how do you use silicone cups. So the biggest, the biggest thing that I find, and we'll get into with silicone cups, is people really aren't applying them very effectively. So then they're just not getting anywhere with it. So that's obviously the first most important thing. Um, so like I said before, I was a fire cupping purist. I am, um, you know, my friends camping, they call me the fire starter. Like I've always, I, I was the kid that burned things in ashtrays as a child. And, you know, when houses were on fire in my town, I, oh, oh, you know, I really am a little bit of a, um, luckily a sane pyromaniac. So um, I really, you know, I gravitated toward cupping. I was like, ooh, fire, it's amazing. And I mean, you know, cupping is, is very cool. It was one of the first things we learned in our training and I had my first cup and I was actually sick after the first time I had cup it. And I mean, the reason for that is that, you know, my own health, I'm one of those people who seems really excess on the surface, but I'm actually really, really deficient. I'm very blood deficient. Um, so a lot of acupuncturists for the first 10 years I went for treatment always treated me you have liver cheese stagnation and damp heat in the lower burner and they were always trying to drain drain release release but I didn't really have um, you know a lot to fall back on so first time I fire cupping was a disaster um, but I still I liked it actually I felt better and it did help with my pain but in terms of my treatment I loved using them on my clients I was always wary of over treatment and who I was using them on. So that was one thing that I already sort of had, you know, going on, but I just didn't think there was anything else. And I certainly found that plastic cups and, and, you know, through all this experience, I can confirm, I think a lot of people really do use plastic cups too strongly on the body, just because you can get that much suction. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, it doesn't have to be painful. So anyway, so I, I went out, I went to the acupuncture supply store in, you know, fairly close to my house and they had these silicone cups sitting there and I thought, oh, those are cute. I wonder how do they work? And I kind of asked them and they, you know, they said, oh, just use them the same way you would glass cups, but you just push them down. And I don't know how many of you got that kind of story when you first started with silicone cups, but I was like, okay, well, how do you wash them? Oh, just use soap and water. And this is the supplier saying this. So, you know, I trusted them and I um, brought them home. But um, later on, right, in research, I realized that you need to clean your silicone cups the same way you clean any other cups. And just as a side note, because um, I did see this come up in the thread as well, you can use all of the same methods to clean silicone cups as you can glass cups. Not, not plastic, but silicone is fine. They can withstand very, very high temperatures. Um, I know people who autoclave them. You can use the sporox, you can use peroxide, you can use the glutathalderide, I hope I'm saying that right, um, chemicals to clean the cups. And like I, my first set of silicone cups I bought seven years ago and I've probably disinfected them. I don't know, probably two or 300 times and my oldest ones are slightly discolored, but they're, they haven't lost any of their tension. Um, they're still in perfect shape. So disinfectant, disinfecting them really isn't a concern. So that's one thing that I kind of wanted to touch on as well. So anyways, I brought these cups home. I took them for a spin, right? I got a body down and I started playing with them and it was incredibly underwhelming. I put them on and I was like, what are these? I can't get suction. They're weird, they're scratchy. Yuck. Like, I guess if you're in a pinch or an emergency and you can't do fire cupping, they would be okay. 
but I basically just set them aside for months. And then as I was teaching, um, I heard about Shirali. I don't know if any of you um, have heard of Shirali and his book, but he did a big book on cupping, traditional Chinese medicine and cupping. And he talks about the history of cupping and goes into a lot of treatments, whatever. So I, I came across his stuff, which led me to Bruce Bentley and, and which led me to seeing that there was more to silicone cupping than I had experienced. So I started to um, a video on a physiotherapist and it was like some joint manipulation. So I was like, oh, hang on a second here. I'm missing something. So um, yeah, so I got down on the table and I started to play with the cups and I started to work with a massage therapist and saw how she used the cups in her massage treatments as well. And then I went, hang on a second here. We can't replace glass with silicone. This is a different tool. It's still a cup, but it's a different tool. And then I really started to look at silicone cupping that way. So as you see here, instead of trading off glass cups for silicone, I traded off my hands for silicone, basically. So I took a lot of the work out of my manual therapy. So this is, this is sort of what I started to work out in my mind um, to really get clarity on why they were so different, right? Glass cups, that rigidity of the glass cup and, and that kind of depth of that moist heat, right? That's, that's a very young, right? We talk about glass cups for releasing stagnation, right? Um, and, and generally we use it on the back of the body and it's usually quite a young, most of us in acupuncture school learned fire cupping as a young treatment. I know some people in some schools worked with fire cupping on like lighter levels, but I certainly did not. It was all about getting deep suction with fire cupping on the back, maybe not as deep with flash cupping. And if you're going to move them, you know, it has to be light enough for the cup to be able to move. And that was sort of the extent of it. But the end game was always that deep suction. So this was a very kind of, this is a young approach, right? So, which is fine and great. And actually amazing because as we all know those young type really strong muscular uh, mesomorphic type people um, it's very hard to treat them right it's hard to really penetrate the tissue so cupping is you know fire cups glass cups are an amazing way to do that um, but the silicone cups I started to quickly realize are much more yin in nature right they're very flexible they're soft let's grab a blue one here like it's it's so soft right it molds when you put it on the body it molds to whatever is in the body it just it just moves much more easily so um they can be used interchangeably but the i always see the silicone cups as a more yin treatment right it's not necessarily that deep treatment it's a lighter treatment so the second photo here you see cups on the abdomen so i do a lot of abdominal cupping um Again, because I was a shiatsu therapist and I did um, Japanese acupuncture, we always palpated the abdomen as a diagnostic tool at the beginning of our treatments. So I started using cupping on the abdomen and you could not have convinced me that as a practitioner who'd been working for 15, over 15 years, that I would feel more with the cup than I did with my hands. You couldn't have told me that, like you couldn't have, there's no way in the world you could have told me that. But I very quickly realized that it was true. And, and then, and it was really working on the abdomen that again, sort of blew my mind again, because I was like, hang on a second. If you get those cups at the right depth, like exactly the right place, they tell you all kinds of things of what's going on in the body. And so at this point, I'm kind of getting a little excited to say the least. And I started working, you know, in the different depths and again, experimenting with it. And I'm a very five element kind of base practitioner. So I started looking at, I'm like, okay, cups are the metal element, right? We have glass, silicone, minerals, stone, that's all part of the metal element. 
So let's look at how the metal element has the impact on the other five elements. So we talk about metal cutting or chopping wood, right? So we all know, right, the gallbladder channel, right, size of the body, all kinds of issues related to the joints, lateral movement, you know, it's, it's often about movement with the liver and gallbladder. So if we can, you know, and it's not like it's, it often is very hard like wood, right? That think about the IT bands and the hips and, you know, these areas can be really challenging to uh, penetrate. So we have, you know, we have a clear kind of idea of that. Uh, and traditionally we use cupping already like fire cupping a lot on the gallbladder meridian, right? It's one of the main meridians that we work on with cupping already. Uh, so metal moves, heats, cools water. So the bladder meridian is by far the, I mean, it's the longest meridian in the body, but it's really the one that most people use the most for cupping. And we can see that how metal can impact, right? That channel and it's such a long channel. So there's so much to move, right? So that's wonderful. So then we talk about metal is nurture, nurtures or cleanses the earth element. So we can look at how the metal impacts, um, you know, the blood in the vessels, right? Strengthening the vessels, which is a big part of the earth element. We can look at how, um, you know, how cups are able to help clean the blood, right? By drawing it to the surface and bringing the impurities out to be cleaned by the lymphatic system. We can look at how, you know, very light gentle cupping also can stimulate the capillaries or capillaries and, um, and get them flowing better, right? This is, these are all techniques that we can do um, with a very gentle approach to cupping. And then we look at uh, metal being softened or melted by fire. So generally speaking, um, cupping can be quite, the, the fire meridians, specifically the um, heart and small intestine can be quite um, sensitive. Right, so if we're doing cupping, for example, um, you know, around the shoulder with a small intestine meridian, we really have to work quite carefully because it has this relationship with the fire element that it actually can feel quite piercing when you apply cups um, to the fire channels or the fire element. But also we know that um, the metal, you know, that the, the heart, I mean, the blood, and the heart organ that we have to be excessively careful when we're applying cupping with anyone with any kind of heart condition, especially now this post COVID thing is just, it's a little bit unnerving because, you know, there's so much clotting, so many clotting disorders that are happening with post COVID syndrome. Um, it, it is a little, you know, we don't really know, like it seems that most people are having very small clots and that a lot of it is in the organs, but it's a big question mark. And personally, I don't touch um, clients with post COVID if they're having symptoms, if they just sort of tested positive and they're not really having any changes, you know, they're sort of back to normal that I'm not that concerned about it, but if they're really fatigued or they're having any kind of symptoms, I don't even touch them with cupping. Um, it just makes me you know, a little nervous. And so because of this relationship, I metal and of course, metal on I didn't even put this here, silly me, its relationship with the metal element as well. So, um, you know, using cups on the large and large intestine and lung channel as well can be very effective. So the other, you know, the other aspect of the five elements, which I find fascinating, and again, I'm always thinking about these things when I'm working, is, you know, the different depths of the meridians in the body. So, you know, we look at the water element, which is again, where, you know, we use glass cupping or fire cupping the most frequently. And it's the deepest, biggest, most substantial, it's the water. So it's, it's the most kind of overall balanced channel in the body. So it's a very safe meridian to perform cupping on um, because we have less worry about, um, you know, negative impact, but also it's the deepest, right? It's very deep. And then we have wood, right? So same thing, you know, the gallbladder channel, there's very few areas in the gallbladder channel that you really have to be that concerned about. You can cup 
you know, for the most part, you're going to do like a moderate to deep level cupping on the gallbladder channel. And then, you know, you're coming up and so you get to um, earth and fire. And again, um, you know, you can do pretty substantial cupping on the stomach meridian, but if we look at the stomach meridian, it's almost on the front of the body, you know, like the, I mean, obviously it is on the front of the body when we're looking at, um, you know, through the face and the torso and then going down the legs, it's sort of slightly lateral, but it's still fairly frontal, which, you know, we know it's, it's the first of, you know, the stomach meridian is the first of the yang meridian and it, um, it is not necessary to cup deeply, but we can still have a great impact, especially through the abdomen and torso, but also the lower legs for digestion, et cetera. And then same with fire, you know, we always, we already kind of talked about it, that again, it's, it's a little transitional. So we're doing like a, a lighter, you know, you wanna work on the level where the imbalance is at. So lung meridian, right? Most superficial. So if we're working the lung meridian, very, very gently. If we're working on the pericardium meridian and in the yin meridians, right? We're very, very gently. We don't want to do a strong gliding. We don't want to necessarily do a strong stationary cupping on these areas, but we want to, I call it kissing, right? Lightly with the cups. I don't say this outside of <laughs> courses and profession because I don't like to sexualize it, but you think about it. And because we especially, well, I mean, a lot of practitioners, we're so used to getting those cups on with kind of a heavy hand. But if you look at, for example, the pericardium meridian, right, we're just kissing it. Just kissing it very lightly. And it has a great impact, especially around the area like the PC6 kind of, uh, you know, five to eight area where those tendons can be really gummed up. Like, I don't know if anyone has put in P6 and had like a, you know, your client almost jump off the table because the tendons in there are just so tight. Right, so you can do a little bit of clearing with cupping, with some gentle cupping, and then apply your needle afterwards, and it'll be much looser. Because that's one of the beautiful things that cupping does, and that's you know it's related to the connective tissue. Is um, there's actually a lot of research coming out now about fascial work, and that's not necessarily something that we look at so deeply as acupuncturists and TCM practitioners, but it really is. It's like they're comparing it to the triple warmer channel. And I, I can really relate to that, especially in terms of, you know, the way we work with cupping and how the fascia, you know, they're, they're demonstrating now that most body pain is actually related to the myofascial system and that there are blockages in the fascia in different areas. So the communication, right. And they're saying, you know, most of our nerve endings are actually in the layers of the fascia. So if the fascia is blocked, then the nervous system isn't sending a clear message. And in between the layers of fascia is this spacious fluid, right? It's this fluid that travels through, you know, the layers and is the conductor of the electronic messages. So when this is interrupted, then the whole system can get totally messed up. And I've seen, for example, like a mastectomy scar that I've worked on you know, for a student. And then the next day she's like, uh, so my rotator cuff injury has completely resolved. Right. And that was, again, it was the fascia around that mastectomy scar being interrupted and totally causing her um, dysfunction in the shoulder. So the research is showing us that the best way to approach the fascia is with dynamic movement, that the best way to really treat the fascia is movement and suction and pressure. So cupping is the bomb for this fascial work. Like it really is the bomb. And I know a lot of, you know, a lot of acupuncturists, I've heard them really kind of slamming the massage and physio um, industry about cupping. And there's a lot of garbage happening out there. There's no doubt about it, but there's a lot of really good work happening as well. Um, <clears throat> people who are really researching you know, this idea of myofascial treatment. And, and for me, it always comes back to the five elements, right? And, and the triple warmer is like the least understood of, I find, of all of the meridians or systems in the body. Um, and I've learned to understand it a, a lot better since I started using these guys, right? Because 
once you get the cups on the body, I don't know if anyone here has a body to work on today, but when you get the cups on the body at the correct level, the body will tell you exactly where you need to go. And once you start to glide the cups, you may glide for a little bit smoothly and then the cup will just kind of get stuck, right? So you know there's congestion or stagnation or blockage or whatever you want to call it under that area. And that's where we use uh, the techniques differently because with stationary cupping and glass cups, we may just you know put them on certain areas, put them on certain points. And then with silicone, one way to do it is to actually use, so you start off and use the gliding cups as a diagnostic tool to assess the fascia and then leave the cups where the fascia is stuck. So it's it's a different way of looking at, you know, same name, same title, but it's a it's quite a different approach. So the techniques is, this is really important. And this is what I'm gonna show you guys. And this is, like I said, it's the number one reason why people struggle with cupping is how they apply the cup. And people go, and they just push it on the body like that. But the problem is that, okay, we know with fire cupping, right? We put the flame in the cup and we know that causes the air in the cup to extinguish. And then it creates a vacuum in the cup and we place it on the body. We also know if we don't get the cup on the body quickly enough that we lose our vacuum, right? So how are we getting a vacuum with a stationary cup if we're just pushing it down, right? Unless you're basically making it fart excuse my language, but you're pushing it down and you're farting the air out, you've just trapped the air inside of the cup when you place it on the body. So that's not very effective, right? So that's the, that's like the number one thing that's happening is people are just kind of whoop, pushing it on and then like pushing on the top of it or giving a squish like this before they lay it on the body. And it's just not gonna work. I mean, it's just, that's just science, right? So when you're using silicone cups, you know, plastic cups, you're sucking the air out. Also, there's an escape for the air so you can get suction. So how are we getting suction with these guys, right? That's, that's the big question. So when you roll the cup on, which I'm gonna demonstrate right here, right now, then as you push the cup on, the air can leave. So then we have to control, right? The amount of air we want to leave by how much we squeeze the cup. So if we're doing a very light treatment, right? just going to push down the top a little bit. If we're doing a moderate treatment, then we push it down farther. And if you want a really deep treatment, you actually grab it by the rim. You see that, right? So your fingers aren't touching the lip, but they're on the rim. And then you crush it. And then you roll it on the body. Because if you just place it on the body, again, you're, whatever air is in there, you're trapping it. When you roll it on the body, you're pushing the air out of the cup. Does that make sense? So I'm going to show you that. Is your back bear here? Okay. I'm going to flip over to my webcam here. And I'm going to stop the video. Maybe. There we go. And... I'm going to, can you all see my screen as the main picture? Okay, perfect. All right. And you can all see my body and I'm just gonna get a little bit closer here. All right. I'm gonna do it from the other side so then you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm using a blue cup so that you can see better as well. So if I'm applying the cup, I'm going to squeeze the top, like I showed you, and I'm going to roll it on like that. Okay. So that was like a superficial, I call that about a two. If I want really light, I'm going to just barely lay it on the body. And if I want a medium, I'm going to squeeze it a little harder. And I'm going to lay it on the body. And if I want a deep section, I'm going to grab it by the bottom and I'm going to crush it and I'm going to lay it on the body. And these are softer cups. So this is a softer texture. So when I do that, the top of the cup actually caves in. If I was using the regular silicone, it may not do that. 
So that's one of the beauties of the silicone cups is that once the tension on the body is greater than the tension on the cup, the cup will collapse on itself. So you very seldom see people over treating with silicone. So that's the application. Now the other application method is just squeezing it like this and laying it on. But I'm kind of anal and I like my cup round. So then I end up spending just as much time rounding it out. But this works in a pinch if you're doing something else and you only have one hand free. It's also not as easy to get the perfect amount of suction when you do it this way. Whereas this way you can gauge it a little bit more. And just like with fire cupping, you may have differing amounts of tissue uptake that is somewhat related to your suction, but it's more related to the condition, right, of the body that you're working on. So that's a biggie, is that application. And you can see, I talk about three main levels. So the most superficial level, right, when you're treating yin type conditions, if you're treating the abdomen, the face, the neck, any tender areas, very, very light comes off very easily. Second level should be a little bit of pullback, but can still come off pretty easily. And then the deep level is not coming off, right? You wanna make sure that you get your finger right under there to remove it. So that is the first piece. I'm gonna just switch my camera back again for a second here. And I'm just gonna mute for one sec. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go back here. Oh. All right. So that's one piece. Next. So we talked about levels of suction. So aiming for three levels of suction, which again, I don't know how many of you have um, sort of talked or learned about working in different levels of suction, but it's really about working where the injury is at, right? We don't need to go deep if it's a superficial, you know, if it's a lymphatic issue or it's, um, you know, the superficial fascia. So it's more of a triple warmer thing. Um, so we want to find, right? And once you practice a little bit and you get on the different layers, you'll start to understand and feel, you know, where it's at. So getting into the right area. So if you're working on the superficial area, that's usually, like I said, the face, the abdomen, sometimes the chest, um, the inner leg, right? You may need more superficial or what I call like a superficial plus. So it's still yin style, but it may be a little bit more moderate, right? So in those lighter areas and then the moderate level of suction, this is where we do most of our gliding. So I'd say from like a two to a four, so medium, or even a medium plus, but we really don't want to glide deeper than that because then you right away create that petechia and um, that's telling you that you're damaging the tissues and then you can't go over it again, right? Because you start to pull the tissue too much. So it's just in that middle area and the moderate kind of level of suction is great for, you know, it moves regular chi stagnation, most of it in this level, rather than, you know, the kind of blood stagnation or blood stasis, you work more in the deep level. Um, moderate level suction is very good for people who have yang deficiency, uh, cold, um, and because movement, right, creates heat. So when I'm, when I'm teaching cupping techniques, I, I often, you know, speak to my clients and I say, well, if, if there's deficiency, if you touch the body and, and it's cold to the touch, like the low back kidney area, if it's cool to the touch, then moving the cups is going to generate warmth, right? It's going to create heat and, and thereby, and as we know, it's one of the hardest things to do is actually to raise the body temperature. It takes the most calories, the most energy that we have out of our day. So moving cups just help support that a little bit more. Whereas stationary, deep suction 
is going to pull out heat. It's going to pull out blood stasis. Stasis. It's going to pull, you know, from as deep. I've heard in different research, three inches and four inches deep in the body. So also you think about the different body areas, and you really don't want to be that deep on certain areas. Deep suction. You know, we know it's amazing on the back glutes, the IT bands, these are great areas to apply deep suction. On the abdomen, we're going to go nice and light, right? Because we can impact the organs and that yin so powerfully. So getting a feel for getting those depths is a really important part of, of using the tools well. Um, and again, the techniques vary a little bit as well. And stationary cupping, you know, we, we use this with our fire cups. And most of the time, I'm still using my fire cups when I'm doing static or stationary cupping. However, you can do like a blanket cupping on the shoulder if someone has a very old injury. You know, they may have torn one muscle 20 years ago. And then since then, they have five or six or seven or eight different things going on. And you apply a complete blanket on the shoulder and then you do mobilizations. And as we know, with fire cups, as soon as you start moving the body around, they start falling off all over the place. So the silicone cups, they stick on much more again, because they're flexible. So they move with the body. And then of course, when they do fall off, they don't make crazy crashing sounds and give people you know, PTSD. So that's another bonus to it as well. But they tend to move very well with the body when you get them applied. Of course, the other, you know, the other piece with all cups, but particularly the silicone as well, is you have to choose the right size for the right body area. If there's a lot of edges and protuberances, then a smaller cup is going to be better because it's going to, um, you know, the edges are going to be uneven. So that's another piece that you have to think about. So stationary cupping, we know, you know, with stationary cupping, again, we often choose our points ahead of time. We place the cups on. Whereas with um, silicone cups, we may glide the cups a little bit and then, and then the points choose the cup, right? So the cups find those sticky points and we leave them there. So a slightly different approach in that way as well. Uh, and then of course there's a pin and stretch technique and you can do this with glass cups as well, it's no problem. But you find, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these techniques in, in just a couple minutes, you find that, um, what is tight, IT bands are a big one, hamstrings, um, quadratus lumborum muscles that often are very fatigued. So you don't necessarily want to put really strong aggressive cups on, but you can just do origin insertion and it makes a really nice gentle stretch with the cups. Um, and again, you know, deep cupping to really pull that deep stuff up and superficial cupping can be very tonifying. So I'm just going to show the um, how I would apply like a trigger point type cupping with gliding. I'm going to show the pin and stretch cupping technique now. Okay. So So if I place the cup, how's that feel? So when I place the cup on and I start gliding, ideally, I want that cup to move very freely, right? So I don't want to have to push the cup. I just want it to be able to move. So I come through here and you can see it moves very well. And then I get to here and it's like, nope, it's not going any farther. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to continue going because I want to see what happens here. And what I find is from there downward, it's a very different story. Can you see how the cup is kind of bending a little bit, right? 
So in here, I have a couple of choices. I can go a little lighter, which is usually how I start and then go deeper with time, but still even lighter, I get to here and cup really doesn't want to move. So I'm going to just put these two on here. I go down and I can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but his QL on the left side is really tight. He's, he's a bit twisted and he's been doing a very physical job lately. So I'm not too surprised. So rather than parking that cup there, what I can do is I can do a pin and stretch. So these are negative ion cups. I call them button cups. I'm not completely convinced that they actually stimulate negative ions. They're not expensive enough to have a true um, negative ion effect, I think. I don't know. I could be wrong. So this is a pin and stretch. So I'm applying the cup at sort of origin and insertion. And then I would just leave them there for a couple of minutes and just let them draw right on that QL. I'm just going to swing over to the other side here and see what I find. So on his right side, you see at this depth, there's not much to say. I go over the shoulder. Oh, it's a little chunky over here. Right. So maybe I'm going to leave one there and then I'm going to grab another one and I'm just going to go a little bit deeper. And along the bladder here, a little bit right here, but not much to speak of. So then I go a little bit deeper. And now I'm feeling the resistance. So the level that I want to work at is between where I just was. And it's right in a kind of three plus because I'm feeling some drag, but there's not any stuck areas. So then I can go on and of course I can continue to use these in all directions, right? Come over here. You might not be able to see that left shoulder. Uh, sorry, right shoulder. He's already marked there. Um, on his shoulder, but you know, then I would go ahead and I would work through the shoulder and I may end up applying several cups in this area again, depending on what I'm finding, what's, you know, what is out of balance. So this would be a pin and stretch. That would be just basically finding the depth when you're gliding the cups. And then there are sort of a couple of other things that I really like to do on the back that we talked about, and they're in the other techniques section. And I just realized, sorry, I gotta find. For the job. I'm going to pin my screen so I can actually make sure that I'm seeing. So just, just to show you guys, all right, I did this. Oops. And I'm just going to place the cup back on. And now as I go over this area, you can tell, right? Oh, I'm going a bit deeper now. When I go deeper, it's a little more congested, but it's moving smoothly. I don't know if you guys could tell before by the way my hand was moving. Like here, see that? It doesn't want to move. So if I wanted to continue working, again, I could park that cup. And of course, you can go and do anything else in your treatment, right? You can put some needles in, you can do some gua sha, you can do some twina, you can, you know, 
the the opportunity you don't have to do just the cupping all at once so um that yes uh if you're whenever you're moving cups i always recommend using oil if you're doing stationary you don't have to use oil even if you're doing the hold and release which i'm going to show you a version of right now you don't have to use oil but the nice thing even with like with silicone cups even with stationary is if you put it on and then you find you know, you can start to feel around. If you have oil on, you can move it. And then you find another stuck pot spot and you can just leave it there. So you don't have to, but I have found over the years using silicone cups that I am getting more into a habit of just kind of laying a thin layer of oil down so that if I do want to do a bit of movement, I can. And if I want to do a lot of movement, I can always add more afterwards, if that makes sense. So this one I'm going to show you is, is work, I'm working directly on the spine, right? Which is something that we wouldn't necessarily want to do uh, with glass cups, unless you have Chinese teacups or, you know, like the perfect size glass cup to really place over the vertebrae at, you know, exactly the right area. So there's a few different cups you can use for this. And usually you're going to sort of base it on you know, some people have big ridges beside their spine, some people's spine, the bones stick out a lot, some, you know, there's a lot of different options. So I'm actually going to start with a small silicone cup. And again, I'm going to start by just doing a glide all the way along the actual spine. So if you can imagine for people who have a lot of spinal issues, um, even clients with MS and Parkinson's and, and conditions like this, like a gentle gliding right over top of the spine can be incredible for them. All right, so he gets a fair bit of cupping because he's often the body that I work on. So the tissues along his spine actually, it actually they actually glide really nicely. Um, you may find on your clients like the first time that you find areas and they're just really, really jammed up. So that's where, you know, again, doing a deep stationary cupping right on top of the spine might not be perfect. So, you know, in Chinese fire cupping, right, we do basically flash cupping. But with silicone, you know, we have more options, right? We can make it a gentler, a slower, a more nourishing approach. So we can move the tissues around in, right in there around the spine. You know, there's really not a lot of ways that we can get into these areas. So we can just kind of move the cups around. And another way, a great way to work, especially if you're finding the muscles on either side of the spine are really, really tight and hard to get into. You know, another technique is two cups and you're doing a cross fiber massage. And this is great, like, again, along the sides of the spine, like here, it's a great way to do it. This is an amazing technique to work on the IT bands for people who have very sensitive IT bands. Because the cross fiber work, I mean, first of all, it gets you into more fibers. But second of all, it creates distraction. So instead of just feeling one line of pulling down their leg, their nervous system, their brain is going, oh, the pain's there, oh, the pain there, oh, it's there, oh, it's there. And so what happens is they just feel less pain because the nervous system doesn't know which pain signal to send. So it doesn't, which is pretty clever. So we can do this cross fiber technique as well. And, and the other nice way, you know, I called it the hold and release technique and rather than uh, flash cupping. And another great area to do it, switch this camera a wee bit, is at the neck here. Because when you are cupping, you have to get a seal all the way around the cup or you won't maintain suction. 
So most people have a hairline that actually can go um, past where the base of their skull is. So when you use the hold and release technique like this, you're still getting that suction. And the research is showing that the initial, you know, one second of suction does have a positive impact. So you can just go in and you just do a little, right? And you're just releasing all these points. There's so many points around here, right, for the head. And so you see now I'm using these elongated cups. These are considered silicone facial cups. And, but I use them a ton on the body. I use them on the spine. I use them on the elbows, on the hands, on the feet, on the neck, on the face, on the chest. Um, because they're long, you can get a really nice, uh, the, the opening is actually a little bit smaller than the smallest of the four sizes of silicone cups. A little bit. So it gives you the opportunity to get into those smaller areas where the cups won't stick and they have a pretty good, pretty good handle. And then these cups, which a lot of people use and they're called body cups. People use them for um, like cellulite treatments. Um, they're great for moving, you know, also on the IT bands area where there's a lot of connective tissue. Um, what I find with them is that they don't communicate as nicely as these mush, I call them mushroom cups. Um, they're like what I used to call the imitation glass cups. Um, but, and you know, the, the glass cups were, the shape was selected for a reason historically, right? They always said the glass cup imitated the shape of the hollow organs. Right, so it's a very similar shape, a little bit different, but very similar. And what it means is the tissue uptake just happens a little bit differently. And so the communication with the body, it's more aligned a little bit, right? So when I'm using these cups, I feel the restrictions under the surface much more freely and easily than um, with the dome cups. Now, some people, swear by the dome cups and that's great. And I think ultimately there's something for everyone. You know, I know some people who always use the really big cups and they have great results with them and they're really comfortable with them. For me, the biggest cups I sometimes use on the scapula and the glutes and a few other areas, but generally speaking, I'm usually using, you know, these kind of middle sizes that cover a lot more body areas, especially if I'm doing longer sweeping strokes and I'm covering narrow areas and wider areas as well. So the tools often are, you know, what you're going to use is often just, it's related to your own experience and how you're going to apply them. And what I love about, um, you know, cupping is once you have the basic rules, right, you know, the indications and the contraindications and the safety and the concerns and how to apply them and sort of how to use them, you can use them like, it's just, there's this entire world of what you can do with them and and that's what I love about it like I'm you know I'm co-writing courses with people who taken my courses a few years ago who then have gone ahead and um and just taken it in different directions because their background their experience is different so I don't think there's one way and I don't think there's an end all and be all either I really believe that this is like a tool right, that can be used in so many ways, whether it's, you know, physiotherapists and the way they use it, can have a whole conversation about that, um, you know, in massage techniques and lymphatic work in, you know, any kind of body work, and of course, applying, you know, in our traditional Chinese medicine methods as well. So I'm just going to go back to my screen just to follow along my PowerPoint. So I don't miss any of the details that I put in here. So we talked about stationary and just waiting for my screen to catch up. There, hello, there we go. And then I talked a little bit about flash cupping rather than the quick flash cupping, which you can also do with silicone, um, but I don't think it's as impactful as fire cupping. Um, you can do these slower methods that are much better for tonication, for the elderly, for children, for first-time cuppers, for people who don't want cupping marks. 
um, for tender areas, right? Working over scar tissue where there may be some, you know, kind of gapping in the collagen between where the scar and the skin meet um, and the cross fiber techniques that I briefly sort of demonstrated there. So those are all different um, ways, right? That the silicone cups can use on the body. Um, and then gliding cupping, of course, which for silicone cups, it really is the, you know, the treasure. I mean, I, you know, applying glass cups and doing gliding cupping can just about drive you nuts sometimes. It's like, oh, cup popped off. Oh, you know, the client has like a really tight fash on their back, you know, or really bony. And as you spend more time relighting your, your flame, than doing cupping. And, and that's the nice thing again with silicone. Oh, it popped off. Boop and it's back on again less than a second later and you didn't miss a beat. So it's really great from, from the application perspective, but also just, I just never felt with glass cups under the tissues, the way that I do with silicone. And I really believe it's because it's flexible. So it, it's grabbing onto everything that's under there. So it just kind of goes Ur! and it stops where there's congestion under the tissues. So for me, that is just, you know, it's another world. Like I said, I mean, all my 20 years of touching abdomens and doing hard treatment, all of a sudden I'm like, what? I can, how can I actually feel this through the cups? Feeling gravelly stuff under the tissues, like, oh, there's so many different things you start to feel under the tissues once you apply, again, at the right depth and with a soft hand, of course, as well, because as soon as your hand's stiff, then you're sort of cutting off that communication from the body through the cup. Um, now again, and again, you know, talked about it briefly, but it's here is the moving cups can be very tonifying and warming on, you know, a lighter level. And then the deeper it goes, the more energetically draining it's going to be. So again, you can move cups on a deeper level for people who are more excess and you can do it lighter for people who are more deficient. And it's wonderful if, if you have moving cups like on your low back and around your glutes and it just, you know, it just creates that tingly warmness, but it's kind of like moxa. It heats, you know, it's heating from a deeper place because it's penetrating deeply into the body. So um, does anyone have any questions? Whoops, going the wrong way here. Um, kind of went into some of the techniques with you guys, but if you feel like I missed anything or, um, you know, if there's something that you were hoping I was going to cover and I just missed, um, let me know, ask away and, uh, can I ask and about try the, to answer. Do you feel like, can I ask about the pin and stretch, um, cupping? I, I have of these, little, I, I got them in Korea, actually, they sell them in spas for people that just put on their backs when they're sitting inside this, the Korean spas. But is this what you were, mm -hmm. what you would use for the pin and stretch? Is this the same? Or do, can you use those mushroom? Yeah, you can use them. Yeah, you can use any cups for pin and stretch. I like, I like those ones, because they're just so simple, like you can just turn it inside out and flip it. And it gives like, that's about the maximum suction that you can get with it so they're great because there's a you know and it's no thought but you can use these you can use the dome cups um, the elongated ones don't pin and stretch very well because they don't get a lot of suction uh, but yeah you can use you can use any you can use fire cups for pin and stretch even you know it's um it's not it's not a problem i think it's just more that it's a technique that we didn't really like again i can't speak to anyone else's training but we just didn't touch on um, most of this stuff in our fire cupping training at all, right? It wasn't even nope. considered. Uh, but then again, back when I uh, back when I studied acupuncture, they didn't even teach Twina in the program back then. So you know, um, that's something that we I'd already had my bodywork training. But um, I do I do find and and you know, and I I think there are different reasons for this, right? And I always say like, for me the way I think about it is a, the tools are different than they were then, right? Obviously we have technology now, so we've been able to create different tools, but the illnesses were different too, right? And we, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago, they just didn't have the kind of toxicity and sluggishness and fatty, like 
fatty livers were not a big deal, right? Because they didn't have enough food to get fatty livers. Like there may be if have been a few emperors or, you know, like really, really wealthy landowners that had an, a huge abundance of, of food around that may have gotten fatty livers. But you look around now and I mean, it's, 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 it's an endemic situation, right? And cupping, as all the books say, nothing moves stagnation in the body like cupping, right? So the application is different. It's just different because the conditions that we see are different. Um, so yeah, so pin and stretch back, I, I, I get on these tangents sometimes. Pin and stretching can be, it can really be used with, with any, pretty much any cups that you can get on and get to stick. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in a situation where you've been somewhere and you know that you could get some cups on someone and, and help them. But, you know, I've done pin and stretch with non-professional cupping devices in a pinch as well, right? <laughs> So it's, yeah, it can, it can be done. It can be done with any of them. And when do you use it for the abdomen? Um, I treat a lot of endometriosis doing abdominal cupping, like a lot. Um, and again, it's like really, 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 really light suction. And there's a lot of caveats to go along with that. Um, when I'm treating my clients, I'm like, make sure you don't have any meetings that you have to be at all day and you know you're probably going to bleed a lot after the treatment and even though it's really 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 light it usually still causes a lot of shedding afterwards so endometriosis is probably endometriosis and digestive issues like I do a full digestive abdominal treatment and treat directly over the liver and gallbladder um and, and just moving, like getting peristalsis going. And the other thing, abdominal cupping. And again, for me, again, all, I think a lot of us in our own experiences come from what got us here in the first place. Right. And for me, a number of years ago, I realized, A, I'm like blood deficient and B, I went into like sympathetic um, stress, like PTSD at the age of seven years old when I was in a crazy accident and so, and why did I have digestive problems my whole life? Because my organs didn't get blood, right? Because I was in panic mode. So my blood was in my brain and my limbs. I was quick on my feet, but my, my guts didn't work at all. And, and you realize when you do cupping on the abdomen, you're also, you're untraining the brain, right? You're, you're telling the brain to bring the blood to the organs, right? It's this drawing that happens. So you have the opportunity to also affect the parasympathetic nervous system to kind of kick it in and get the blood to the organs so the organs can work better. You're clearing, you know, same thing when I do, you know, for clients who go between um, um, diarrhea and constipation or are more constipated in nature, I tell them like, you could poop a lot in the next two days. And I mean, buckets and buckets, right? And people cannot believe like if anyone has ever had a stomach bug and you're like, how, how was that much shit in my body? Excuse my language. Right. But it's the same thing. If you do a good, like a good thorough abdominal cupping treatment and you treat the liver, a lot of pooping happens. So it's really good for people who have sluggish digestion. Obviously part of peristalsis is also the function of the diaphragm. So I do a lot of diaphragm cupping to release the diaphragm. And then when the breathing is deeper, peristalsis works better. So no, there's just, there's so many, so many applications. It's crazy. And it's like, that, that, that was me for three years. Oh, let's try to, let's see what happens when we cut that, you know, and just trying all these different things and scars. Yeah. I have a whole class on scar cupping, right? It's like a two hour masterclass. And I take, you know, and I go through a little bit of the physiology of scar formation and different types of scars. Um, you shouldn't cup keloid scars. You shouldn't cup um, hypertrophic scars, the ones that keep growing because the stimulation could actually create more keloids or uh, worse, worsen the hypertrophic scar because it's like an overgrowth of collagen. But C-sections, those old appendix scars, mastectomy, you know, any even laparoscopic scars, tiny little keyholes, they're often um, treating surgeries that are deep in the body and you can't see the internal scarring that's going on but when you cup the area you feel that congestion and you can clear it and you know with scars what happens is it's a chi you know it's a chi stagnation situation 
is the healing response happening, a shunt is created around the injury. And this happens with a, you know, an injury to a muscle as well, right? The body, the inflammatory response comes, the body shunts, it, it brings fluid to the area and the fluid and the blood work really hard and they make a ton of collagen, right? And the collagen fiber within 24 hours starts to lay down in the area. But if people are still moving, especially, or they're still doing things, they can get um, more collagen than is needed, which happens most of the time, but again, some more than others. So, so then you've got all this extra collagen fiber that's kind of floating around in that area, but it's not needed. And so when you cup it, it flushes it out. And the other thing is it helps to like scar tissue when it lays down, it lays down very randomly. So um, it, it can block the nerve, it can block the fascia, it can get stuck to the tissues and it can block blood flow as well, right? Because collagen fiber doesn't have a, a blood source. So when you get in there and you start cupping, it, it liberates, it lines up the collagen and then it liberates all of the nerve and the blood in the area and it pulls that extra gunk and also you think about heat and inflammation, what it does is it tends to dry any leftover fluid and then it becomes gummy. And then it's even harder for the stuff to pass. So cupping just cleans, it's just like garbage removal, right? It's like Marie condoing your scars. It's just like, phew, you're just clearing all that stuff out. Um, how soon after surgery? Well, I usually, um, I usually say, I mean, it depends on how deep the surgery is in the body and how, um, you know, what is being cut. If it's something like, for example, an ACL ligament replacement, you might, might be able to get at it six weeks to two months. If it's something more internal, like it's a hysterectomy and they're cutting through all the different layers or even a C-section, you know, deep um, where they're working on organs. So there's many, many, many layers of tissue that need to be healed. Then usually three, four months, sometimes even as long as six months, but you'll see the scar itself will be very red right around the scar. And then over time, you'll see that redness just pale down. And once the redness is paled down, it starts to flatten out a little bit, then you can start working on it. Now, having said that, you can still work distally, right? So the, again, that collagen might be cruising around in the area and not focused. And so you can work distally from the scar to help clear out, which will improve circulation and speed up the healing. So you can do all of that earlier on, but working directly on the scar, you wanna make sure it's really quite healed up. And abdominal cupping, gliding and static, yes. So I, I do something very similar where I start to glide and then anywhere where there's restrictions, then I usually let the, park, the cups park <coughs> in those locations and you're usually gonna find it over the valves Right, the liver, the gallbladder, the ileocecal valve, the um, the big lymph valve, which I'm have a terrible memory, um, you know, which is basically CV12. Um, you know, the area of stomach 24. There's valves on either side of that. Sorry, yeah, stomach 24, um, right and left side. Those areas tend to be blocked. You may go along and find, you know, through the um, small or large intestine over the uterus, over the ovaries, um, and also the psoas, right? You can access the psoas from the front of the pelvis as well. So, um, yeah, so you're working, you know, you can do the cup and release technique, you can do gliding and static. The most important thing is to put it on ridiculously light, so light that you can't imagine anything's happening, and then you go even lighter. Like it's light, 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 light. And if you even go to a moderate amount of suction, the person will probably feel like garbage afterwards, right? So it's really, 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 really light. It's like cupping on the face, right? If you don't do super light cupping kisses, they're gonna get marks. People are gonna get marks and that's the opposite of what you want to happen. And if they're old like me, right? And you start pulling the skin, they end up, you end up pulling the skin. You're not gonna get that collagen working and, and tighten up the skin, you're going to end up um, with bigger problems. So I always say, if you question if it's light enough, it's not light enough, right? 
So, and we're trained, right? We're so, we're so inundated with cupping that it has to be like, got to get good suction. If you don't get good suction, you're not doing a successful treatment. Um, but it's just, it's a different way. And even with Bruce Benson, Bentley, like I took a training with him and I was very surprised, you know, when he teaches his fire cupping training, he doesn't even let you start treatments until you can attain five levels of suction. And the lightest being, like I'm talking about this, like barely, and with fire cupping, I'd never had an experience like that before, but we're the lightest, you know, I've done this lightest with silicone, but I'd never approached fire cupping or glass cupping that way, but it's like this really, really, really light suction, but it still, still works amazingly. So any other questions? All right. So I'm just, uh, do you glide for TMJ or kissing? Um, because it's the jaw, I mean, certain treatments like Bell's palsy and TMJ and more severe stuff. Um, I usually get special consent on the face because chances are because of the TMJ, A, it's a joint and B, it's, there's much bigger muscle in the area as well. So you may have to work a little bit lighter in the area, but you can glide and you also can do like some of the sort of rotational techniques, right, for TMJ. And then of course you don't wanna forget. And again, you wanna work on the SCM scalings when you're talking about TMJ, right? So um, again, very, very light because it's the front of the neck. You don't want to retain, you don't want to um, you know, add any kind of deep suction there. Um, but because there's less, I mean, there's, there's more lymph and muscle and less blood here than other areas of the face. So it marks less than other parts. Um, so you can go like a two, you know, like just a little bit deeper on the TMJ, but uh, yeah, I usually, I work it right. If you think about how, when they massage TMJ, they push, right. But you're, so you're creating space in there. So you're allowing that joint to actually fall into place. And it may be with really, and usually again, you know, I usually start with super, super light and then you can go, you know, you can always go deeper. It's hard to go deep and then lighten up afterwards. So I usually start with the lightest and see what happens. And, you know, often on the opposite side first and then see if it's made a change and then work a little bit deeper into it. So the first time I'm treating a new condition with someone, I'm usually extra careful. And I often find that really, really, really like careful works, right? Sometimes I have to go deeper, but it's, it, it often works really well. Sinuses, yeah. I mean, you can go, I, I actually have um, a great sinus technique slash tutorial. Um, it's on my YouTube, but the sinuses, you're actually, you put it on and you, so, where most cupping you're working on the application it's like when you're chasing the wind as well if someone has a scratch the the trick in the sinuses is pulling it off because you want and i mean you can also put it on and then you know you can do this kind of stuff to kind of try and release the mucus from the sinus and try and get the sinus cavity cleared up but that pulling off is where you'll feel it, whoa, and then they'll feel their sinuses drain. So in that case, I mean, again, if someone is, is tortured with sinus issues, probably a tiny little mark on their face is, is going to be a blessing to them. Like I used to have to take sinus medication from like the beginning of March for two months and then two months again in the fall and nothing really helped. And, and I literally, um, I was flying to California to teach class and, uh, and I got a cold two days before and I cupped my sinuses and I did a video. My son shot the video and I'm in my bathroom and I'm like, and I was like gross snotting, you know, I'm like, how am I going to get on an airplane with this? And I was like, well, let's put these little suckers to the test. And, boom, and I've, I literally have no sinus problems anymore. Like I get occasionally a little bit, right. And I just go in, do, 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 it's good. I haven't had to take a pill for sinuses in like five years, which is amazing. And then this, I still get a little bit of sinus headache sometime, but I think that's more like that congestion is more deep in the head, right? As opposed to actually the sinuses themselves. Yeah. Any other questions? I just wanted to say thank you, Lisa. And we want to study more. 
we, this has been so helpful. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. I, you know, after, after I offered, I was like, oh, I hope people don't think I'm doing a big sell. I mean, I do have classes and you're welcome, you know, but I really just, you know, I just see acupuncturists and I see so many of them saying, oh, I hate silicone. They suck and they're useless. And I'm like, no, they're amazing. Right. I love them so much now for a pyromaniac to say they love silicone cupping, right? There's, there's something there. So I just want to share, but I'm just going to, so I'm just going to share what I have here and how you can find me and I'm going to send out the recording and in the recording I'm actually just going to ask you guys do you want more information so I'm not going to automatically like put you on lists and send you um, information but I want to ask you guys if you're interested because I have lots of online training and if the world opens up again I may do you know some more live training again one day as well um, but for now I've managed to get it where like I've kind of figured out you know we have a whole as you see a studio here and lots of cameras and lights and it works really well so so I have a five element cupping which is basically meridian cupping so what I talked about um, with the channels and the depths and meridian stretching right and applying cups with mobilizations and it's really great especially I find shoulders and hips um, facial cupping a scar cupping class and then two production, which is for female re reproductive concerns and digestive function. So that's a lot of abdominal, but also sort of body cupping to support that. And those are much shorter classes, right? The five elements, like a 12 hour training. And then those other ones are just like a couple of hours each. Um, and I'm sort of in the process of getting a more CE uh, approval for this stuff as well. And I just hit my chat bar and it disappeared. So I'm going to wait to see what happens there. And then this is, so when I started this whole thing up again, it was kind of an accident from a post in a, in a body work group and people started asking me to come and teach. And so I was like, it's the cupping revolution. Cause it was like silicone for me, silicone cups were this just incredible thing that happened. So um, and one of the, uh, not one, actually a couple of people who messaged me said, oh, this is, you know, it's lovely of you. And, and would you set up a, oh, I didn't even put it there. Great. Would you set up a, um, PayPal link so that we can give you a donation? And I really like, don't feel obligated at all because I literally did this and I benefit from it too. So I don't see it as, you know, anything you need to do, but if you feel like you want to, um, it's paypal.me slash cupping revolution. And that's fine as well. But like I said, don't feel obligated. Um, I have cupping supplies in my online store. Um, and same thing I was supplying for courses. And finally, I said, my partner has a business that he actually sells Lego online. And he's like, I can do this for you easy. So I was like, all right. So I started ordering actually one of the suppliers reached out to me and asked. And so I started bringing in and they're the same cups that everyone else is selling. You know, they're all, they all come out of the same two, three factories. I have Green Island. Oh, that's something I was going to talk about a little bit, actually, is the types of cups. So um, Green Island was the first company. They patented the silicone cup. And the Green Island cups have a little logo on them here. And they're ever so slightly more rigid than you know, the other regular silicone cup, but they're basically identical. They're more expensive. And, you know, they claim that they're the highest quality. I'm not sure if they are because I've never had a cup die on me. Like I've never had a cup break, snap, lose its anything. Um, but so we carry Green Island cups and we carry our own, you know, another brand of silicone cups as well that are a little less expensive, but they're still very high quality. Um, and, you know, you can buy a ton off of Amazon. And when I was shopping it out and I was getting these cups sent to me, I was like, are you kidding me? They were garbage, right? Some of the facial cups, they just like snap, um, you know, so there's definitely a lot of low end cups out there. Um, but our supplier has basically guaranteed the products. So I'm um, great. Um, and we have, uh, I didn't even talk about the glass bulb facial cups. I mean, you know, we have these. I sell some, I only sell sets of 12 plastic because like I said, I'm not a lover of plastic cups. 
but the sets of 12 are nice because they come with a gun and a tube so you can treat your own back, which is really convenient. Um, I don't sell glass cups because there's no point. I mean, you can buy them anywhere for $2, right? And um, they're, they're easy to come by and they're incredibly expensive to ship. And I also support some of our local um, artists. I don't have my flaming, I was hoping to get my flaming cups, but I also have John Fu Medicinals, beautiful hand-blown cups. Um, I don't sell them, I just have them. Um, and so there's, there's tons and tons of cups that uh, you can buy. If you, if you do end up taking courses with me, I always give store credit and a percent off for my students because at the end of the day, we have our warehouse in our basement. So unless my store gets too big, you know, and I have to actually rent space for them, I don't need to have the same kind of markup as other big retailers. So our prices are not only competitive, but they're better. Um, so, and I, you know, again, I don't want it to be a sell, but it's true. Um, so that's a bonus. Anyways, so that's some of the places you can find. I will send you guys an email and um, Lisa, you... I have a question about the, the um, sterilizing. It, are they medical grade or not really in terms of like heat sterilizing? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can clean them exactly the same way. In fact, apparently a lot of glass cups, you can't even put it in autoclave. I've heard that they can explode because they're often not medical grade glass. Um, but yeah, the silicone, these are all medical grade. They can be fully sterilized. You can use UV, you can use an autoclave, you can use the sporox peroxide, any of the products on them. And I have left my cups. This is probably one of my old cups. You see it's slightly cloudy. Some of my cups I've left in the peroxide solution and gone on vacation and forgotten about them. Went, ah, I came back. Well, I guess this will put them to the test and they're fine. So yeah, they're, they're really, they're super silicone. That's the thing about them. They'll be here long after we are. Right. So, um, right. You know, that's, that's not a, not a problem at all. Okay. Um, Lisa, do you have information? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, because the little yellow box. Do you have information about sterilizing? I haven't used cups in my practice because the sterilizing was so intense. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's just going to take so much time. I always thought this would take so, so much of my time. So I just use them personally. Mm -hmm. Not very much. Like I learned a lot today. But I sometimes have asked clients, just buy your own and mm -hmm. I can help you with it. But I don't want to <laughs> have to sterilize. So it kind of solved the problem, but if there was an easier way, I've always boiled them. Yeah. Is there an, yeah, an easy way to sterilize that's not so time consuming? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm just gonna write down that I include in the email. Okay, thank you, yeah. Um, the the inf information on disinfection, but it, if you go on YouTube yeah. and you put in my name and you put in disinfection cups, Okay. I have a video on there. It's like a 12 minute video and it takes you through the entire disinfection process. Okay. Um, I think, you know, I don't think you need to, I mean, if you need to use is great, but I don't think you need, I don't think it's like something you need to go, you know, take an entire course on. I also have like a PDF guide. So I'll put the PDF guide in um, this. And that was one of the first things that I did when I got into this is um, because this whole soap and water thing, and I spoke to someone there like, why would you only use soap and water on silicone when you're sterilizing your other cups? And I was like, uh, yeah, that's a really good point, right? And then I started digging deeper into it and I found Aria Nelson's uh, research on um, disinfection and, and I went to the CDC and the WHO and I mean, I don't know that we can completely trust them, but um, they, you know, they do have guidelines and, and it's something that I've actually been back and forth with them for a few times because they say that if there's no uh, broken skin that you don't need to do high level disinfection, right? That you only need to do low level disinfection. But the argument is that, you know, in this study, it demonstrates that even with light level cupping, when they use the UV swat, they found blood cells on the cups. Right. So if we're talking about bloodborne illnesses and there's blood cells on the cups, then the risk of 
you know, it's one in, you know, people say, oh, well, I've been cupping for 20 years and, you know, I've never had a problem. Well, you're going to keep rolling the dice on that because that's what it is, right? It's, it's like a one in however many millions chance that your client is going to get something, but it could be something that kills them, right? Like it could be hepatitis or it could be, you know, a really like the bacteria that needs the high disinfection is the same bacteria that has this, a lot of, does a lot of harm. So um, for me, I'm like, why would I set up two levels of disinfection anyways? It doesn't make sense to have two whole stations, high level disinfect everything, go to sleep at night, right? Without any concerns whatsoever, whether I gave an infection to my client and get on with it. And, you know, once you get the stuff and you do it a couple of times, it's not hard. It's, it's really, I mean, it does take up space and there is time, it is time consuming, but you find, you find a system, right? Whether you take a break during the day and you do some disinfection, whether you keep a big bucket there and you have all your cups and you do them all at once at the end of the day, if you're back in, you can leave them overnight, come back in in the morning, rinse them and let them dry. You know, there's lots of different ways you can do it. That isn't so time consuming. Um, but obviously you do need to wash them really well with soap and water before you disinfect them no matter what. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of annoying, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, cupping takes out so much of the physical work of what we do and it works so well, right? Like I get, I do shoulder stuff. People have had 20 year shoulder injuries and I, and I work on their shoulder with silicone cups and I do mobilizations and in five minutes, they feel better than they felt in decades. You know, like it's, it's just amazing. Like I can't even, I can't even begin, you know, to, to grasp all of the different things. Same with endometriosis. I mean, I have clients who've had endometriosis since they were teenagers, pain, headaches. They have to take crazy amounts of medication. They're in bed, you know, migraines and boom one, two treatments and their symptoms, you know, and they come in for management, but it's like barely anything. So it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing, you know, and it really hasn't been addressed that extensively. I find, I, I mean, I haven't, I hadn't come across a lot of this stuff. I just sort of used my clients as a, an experiment. <laughs> Lisa, I had a, I have a patient who just had a, well, not just, it was a while ago. She she's healed uh, within the last year, a double mastectomy and they, and they grafted all, a lot of the fat when they did the reconstruction surgery from her abdomen. And um, so her abdomen is so tight, like it's pulled like leather across a drum um, mm. from having done that surgery because she was, didn't have that much fat to begin with. Um, it seems like this might be a good thing for that. Does that sound right? Yeah. 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 And it, I mean, it may be really tender again because of all the tightness, but you can start with some very gentle hold and release techniques, right? You want like collagen is not very elastic. It doesn't move very easily. So when you start looking at those big, broad scars, it's really, um, it's really hard. It's really hard to um, get comfortable and it's a year ago. So if you start working on it now, you can also prevent all kinds of stuff in the future for her as this tightness starts to pull the fascia, you know, next thing you know, she's got pain in her right hip and her left knee and her right ankle and you know, her left shoulder and it just, it just ping pongs through the entire body. So definitely, I mean, you start working on those scars and you can just totally prevent all of that. I, you know, and again, I've seen it hip replacements, you know, people come in and like, yeah, my right hip is a problem, but oh my gosh, my left knee is so bad. And it's like, you work on the hip and the knee goes away. And then you may have to do, you know, a little bit of extra work on the knee but ultimately, you know, you're just, you're just bringing that um, balance right back into the body. So yeah, for sure. It's, it's wonderful. And was it the, the mushroom cups that you were using on the abdomen, the smaller ones? I forget which you ones. Can use, you can use the smaller ones, but I tend in scars, I tend to use this one the most, or even the glass cups as well. Oh. Um, the glass facial ones. Yeah, partially because like 
you can't get very deep with these, but also it's just, it's a lot easier to kind of press and release it and press and release it. So for me, it feels a lot more comfortable as well. But for the just general abdomen, do you use the mushroom cups like endo and things like that? Yeah, usually I use um, either the, the two middle exactly. or the three smaller sizes for something where again, it's, I always choose the size of the cup based on what it is I'm actually working on. So if I'm working like around the ovaries, I may use the smallest one, right? If I find, you know, the ileocecal valve is jammed or I might put like the little one on one of those areas that are sticky. If it's a larger, like I may put a larger one over the liver. And if you start doing this, you're gonna be like, oh my God, like every, it's probably 60% of the people whose abdomens I, I treat their liver in at least one place is just like so sluggish it's just stuck there and you just leave a cup there and then keep going and then you come back to it and it's like oh it's moving oh now it's stuck here you know and you keep moving it and again and then they're like wow I really had a lot of bowel movement but and same thing I mean I also have background in osteopathy right so I've worked a lot with like the connective tissue and the liver gets stuck right once it gets kind of big and inflamed it gets stuck into the periosteum area and the diaphragm and all of that inner fascia, right? So you just kind of liberate that and then the breathing improves and then they're standing straighter and it's just like this amazing trickle down effect. So when you're working on the liver, are you going over the rib or just under the, in the soft tissue under or all of it? All of it. And, and, you know, and again, with experience, you start to see, like I always say, and I mean, we know this with, um, you know, in TCM that you like liver 14 is usually more of a deficient liver point, right? And liver 13 is usually more of an excess point. And, and you'll find that you'll find like when you go above the ribs and you feel it sticky, it's often more related to blood deficiency. It might be like a leaner body, um, just generally more deficient. And when you feel the bottom part of the liver, you'll find that there's more distension and all of the more what we consider congestion, stagnation stuff. So, you know, a lot of it comes just with practice and experience as well, but first that door has to open. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, that's what this call was sort of about. It's like opening that door for people so they can start to think about, Oh, right. I can work right on the organs here, you know, and, but alternately I see people working on the kidneys and I'm like, don't put deep cups in the kidneys, you know, and I actually got into a whole conversation with someone about that recently. And it's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, not any of the organs, but people don't think because the ribs are protecting them at the back, but you know, we were made that way because our kidneys need that protection. Right. So, um, and it, but again, you can have, you can have a good impact, but if someone has a history of kidney stones going really, carefully as well. Uh, you do lightest level cupping on people on the abdomen any size? Yeah, usually. I mean, you tend, what you'll find, Larissa, is people with more fat on their abdomens, um, the cups will just grab more. And, and even though it may be still really, really light, you'll see more tissue in the cup, right? You'll see more in the cup. And you just may use a larger cup. But the depth of the suction doesn't really change. Um, just you just go in a little bit deeper. And actually, it's hard um, to get really light suction on people who have very, very thin, thin, um, like no fat, right? It's hard because the cup just kind of <laughs> like it really wants to stick on tightly. Uh, luck with numbness on the feet. Yeah. Yep. And again, it depends why. I mean, there is a contraindication slash caution on diabetic neuropathy because if there is a loss of sensation, um, it's hard for them to tell whether, like, to feel what's happening. So um, that's, you know, that's a concern. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can work. And again, if it's a nerve, then you want to work up, you know, you can work up the nerve and then you want to look at where it's attaching. In the body as well and also you know what other pathology is going on but you know numbness and tangling is usually a sign of some blockage entrapment somewhere so 
you know, basically like flossing a nerve with a cup and it's more comfortable than, you know, that technique of nerve flossing too. So yeah, there's so many applications. It's just crazy. It's like, wow. I mean, when I, when I first started, when this thing blew up for me, you know, I had a full practice and I was teaching in schools and all, and I had just, and I, you know, these people were asking me to teach cupping classes. And I, I went into, you know, a, a Facebook group of um, Canadian or Ontario uh, body workers. And I said, I'm just putting this out there. Does anyone want a cupping class in your city in the next two months? I was going to Japan um, to take some advanced acupuncture training and I had zero dollars in the bank. I was completely broke. My credit cards were all up and I'm like, hey, maybe I can, you know, get some cash for my trip. And, and people were asking. So I was just like, write your city in the poll and see what we'll do. And the next thing you know, in like five weeks, I was doing 10 cities and, um, and a full practice. And I'm getting there on my clients and I'm like passing out on my clients. And, and that's when I really started. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try cupping for this because it's so much easier, you know? And I just tried, I just started using it for everything for a while because I was tired you know, I was exhausted. And that's, you know, and that's where a lot of this stuff sort of started to play out. I'm like, okay, I'll try it for this. And then I just started taking notes like crazy and, and, uh, and I just kept doing it. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how many, um, how many conditions it can really, and especially in partnership, I mean, in partnership with everything we do, gua sha and moxa and acupuncture and herbs. I mean, obviously the whole thing is amazing. Um, but I don't do herbs and I hear a lot of herbalists say, well, you know, you can't get results without herbs, but I get great results. So, you know, it's all, everyone does it differently. Get to the result that the important thing is, is that you get to where you need to go. Right. So. Can I ask you one more question, Lisa? Yes. Okay. So this is around, um, when you were referring to people with mastectomies, so I have some um, friends that have had the problem with the lymphatic drainage following that because the lymph ducts are actually removed and they may go to like massage for lymphatic drainage and like even acupuncture sometimes is sort of a cautionary modality because they say infection. Would you ever do cupping in that or do you know anything about it? No. Um, lymphedema is, is a specialty. Yeah. Um, so it's considered contraindicated. Yeah. You can, you can work distally, right? If it's the right shoulder, you can work, you know, the torso and the legs and the arm to try to improve lymphatic function. But as soon as so much lymph has been, or the ducts have been removed, then yeah, it's, it's, it starts to become more um, specialized. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thanks for showing up and I hope you got lots out of it and um, I have your email addresses. So I've just made a little kind of um, point of all the stuff I'm going to send to you out in an email and with the recording and yeah, I um, hope that it helps you on your silicone cupping adventures. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. And yeah, we'll see. I guess we'll see you all in the lunchroom. Thank you so much. All right. Much. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.